you are listening to Fanfare Tracks. Because of the following special program, Wonder Woman and the Incredible Hulk will not be presented this evening. Star Wars news in a single file. This is Making Tracks. Here are your hosts, Mark Newbold and Mark Lowcaster. That's not true. That's impossible. You're listening to Making Tracks. I'm your co-host, Mark Newbold, and joining me today is a man who is more rock than Geonosis, more metal than a droid foundry, and more jizz than, well, it's Mark Lowcaster. Mark, how are you doing? Yeah, very well. I'm uh, prepping to go to Barcelona uh, with Elixir this weekend to play Metal Cover, which is some kind of uh, heavy metal festival that I should probably know more about than I actually do. But uh, there you go. That's the life of the rock and roller. You go where the tour bus takes you and you don't really care as long as there's a hotel and a warm bed. How are you? How's things? I'm good. Blissful ignorance has got me through 52 years so far, so don't knock it. It's all good. <laughs> I'm very well, thank you. I'm looking forward to chatting because it's been yeah. it's been blooming ages. Wasn't it last week? Probably, but it felt like longer. Well, it's it's, it, yeah, it's, it's what, kind of it's one yeah. of those weird Star Wars time periods, isn't it? When the, we're, we're waiting for the next project to come along, we don't really know what it's going to be. To be honest, right? I can't really. Well, definitely not in in the ten or eleven years since Disney acquired Lucasfilm have we had such a fallow period. Now, obviously, this is not necessarily down to anything that is happening with Lucasfilm and Disney per se, i.e., they're, they're holding stuff back. It's down to I think still the writers and the, the Screen Actors Guild strikes. Very desolate place at the moment, but you know, fair play to fan for tracks because let it not be said that they can find Star Wars news anywhere. So, first question then: What's new in your collection? I have a copy of Star Wars Timelines. Very much looking forward to re- having a good read through that because I love the timeline stuff. Not, you know, not a lot else. I've got, I know I've got a bunch of comics to pick up from Matt when I see him this weekend yeah. at London Comic Con Winter. Weirdly, very, very little, not by choice, just not a lot has come along. What about you? So Echoes of Celebration in Europe turned up this week. So I've got the Black Series Adventure of the Jedi Darth Vader in the plasticless box. And also, speaking of books, Dawn of Rebellion, the visual guide. Oh, you've got it already. Nice one. Yeah, well, I got it because the thing is, you know how it is, books get announced. So I just go on and just pre-order them from Amazon. You know, you tend to get the cheapest price that way for one and and completely forgot about it. So I figured, well, I'll just do what I did the other weekend when I went to this James Bond book thing and just kind of took my books that I've already brought and get the authors to sign it. So when I head down to Father's From, I will hopefully corner Mr. Pablo Hidalgo and get him to sign it. I need to get mine pre-ordered as well. I know that all the cool stuff have copies that you can pre-order so you can pick it up when you're there and, and get Pablo to sign it, which is probably what I'll do. That show's racing up on us. We've got some announcements yep. coming fairly soon because Fanta Tracks will be, once again, as we usually are, involved in Fire This From. So we'll uh, firm all of that up, but Fanta will be there, along with other great sites and podcasts and good folks. Hopefully Dave will be coming on as well to talk about Fire This From. But let's dive into the news, Mark. Carl Newman, he was a guest on Fantasy Tracks last week. We talked about his new documentary that he has produced called A Disturbance in the Force. And the great news that we were able to help share is that a screening of A Disturbance in the Force will be coming to the Prince Charles Cinema in London, just off Leicester Square, yep. on the evening of Thursday, the 16th of November. It's at 8.45. But of what you've seen oh. of Disturbance in the Force, and there was a trailer that's recently come out, what are you making of it? Because it's obviously about the holiday special, which is much decried, but also kind of loved. I really like the fact that somebody's actually kind of had the balls to do it. It kind of takes somebody with a little bit of clout, such as uh, Mr. Carl Newman, to get across the line. I, I mean, I think it's a really interesting, I mean, obviously it's a super niche documentary, but then that is kind of the uh, the beauty of streaming services. There's a, a home for just about any topic. It looks good. It looks great, in fact. I wish I'd graded it, but hey, didn't get a chance to speak to Mr. <laughs> Carl Newman and give him my business card last week. So uh, next time, maybe if he is in London and I can get down there, because I do like the Prince Charles Theatre, I will I will do that and I might give him mates rates as well. Save him a couple of quid so he can probably buy an extra bag of Harry Bro for the screening. The holiday special, obviously, for me, without rubbing it in, kind of like slightly younger, like second generation Star Wars fans, it was out. It was kind of, it already had its infamy, I think, by the time I really caught wind of it. I don't even know when I did. It was just one of those things that was mentioned as a footnote 
more often or not. And it's only really, I'm going to say the last 10 years or so, where it's really been propelled into like, I think before of the fandom, a lot more people know about it or have actually watched it beyond, say, the Boba Fett animated section. I think it's kind of cool. It's like everything with Star Wars. I think when you look back, it kind of like it capsulates something about the time and when it's been made and what was going on with the actual kind of uh, franchise when it was being produced, which, of course, at the time was it was still very much in its infancy. Where does this sit for you? It's a funny one. You've ratcheted up really well there. It, it was so much of its time, like any 70s Star Wars feels very 70s, whereas once you get past Empire, it kind of becomes its own entity, if that makes sense, to which shows and TV, things like Rogue One and Andor can go back to that era and it work. But Star yeah. Wars, Holiday Special, anything of that era very much feels like a 70s thing. I was always aware of it because it was sort of out there in fandom being mentioned in various places. But the first time I really remember being very aware of it was those conventions in the sort of the late 80s, early 90s, mostly the 90s, when it started to sort of be seen at, at conventions. And I know I saw it for the first time as a, a VHS that you could buy from a stall, probably one of Jason Joyner's events in the mid-90s. But I think over the years, like you say, it's been reappraised in the sense that there's lots of cool little nuggets in there. And it was a variety show, uh, which is just kind of a very 70s thing. It wouldn't work in the 80s or the 90s or anywhere beyond that. You get the rifle turns up in Mando. You've just had the vintage release of Chewie in the robe. Life yeah. Day gets mentioned in Mando. So there's all these little moments and elements that are sort yeah. of out there. Introduction exactly. of Boba Fett. It's important. Yeah. Oh, it is. It's very important. And like one of the, the last figures I pre-ordered was the uh, Chewie in the, uh, the Life Day robes. I mean, I, I was in a uh, Disney store in yeah. Oxford Street. Uh, this is like back in, I think, probably about May or April, Matt, and they had a just a random Chewbacca plush with uh, the Life Day robes and the orb. And for people I was with, everybody was like maligning it. I'm like, I want mm. that. That's the coolest yeah. thing ever. And also, it's like, it still is. for some for, On some levels, it's still a very deep cut when you think about it. When you sometimes see people at Celebration cosplaying as various characters, it kind of really does show you how it's still very niche. But I do like how... And I think it's done in with the best intentions, how it's being folded in the canon these days. I think I think that is really cool. Um, it's a good point about the cosplay because you do occasionally, like Roosevelt's released a shirt and you've got the Acmina in, in the exactly. Acmina crowd. You yeah. see Gormanda cosplays with all the arms. And so you're right. There, there are some things out there that really tick them up. Exactly. Marks. You know, going back to the, the, the topic, the disturbance of the force, the actual documentary looks really good because there's a lot of, pretty big names in it of you know you've got kevin smith and you've got donny osmond and seth green yeah sorry it's because because his, his, his red hair doesn't look quite so red now he's kind of getting on a bit but uh, <laughs> you know so so i mean and and we know obviously for those who, who know kind of Carl Matt, you know these are people that have kind of ran in his kind of circles and stuff but i think it's really cool and i just love even the whole notion of sticking interviews and film clips and stuff onto like old you know crt four by three tvs at the top of the trailer i think looks really cool so i'm really looking forward to it and i really do hope i can get down to the prince charles and see it 16th of november i will add that to my diary hey it's kyle newman and you're listening to fanta tracks first of december we'll see the arrival finally on disney plus of indiana jones and the dial of destiny but not only that joining the other four movies that are already there, and in the States, of course, Young Indy. But also there is a documentary called Timeless Heroes, which looks at Indy, but also looks at Harrison Ford and his enduring appeal, directed by Lauren Boozerow, who did all those fantastic documentaries around the episode one era of what you've seen. And there is a trailer out there that just looks incredible. Exciting times to be an indie fan, isn't it? I think so. I think it's pretty cool. It's nice that we're getting this as well. I think it's definitely something that um, the series needed. A bit like we've had with all the other Star Wars series. You know, mm. we've had like the gallery and various different names of, of that. So it's nice that we're getting this. I think it's, it's going to be good because it's going to be obviously a celebration of, like you said, both the character and the man behind the character in the hat himself. Indiana Jones is, is like Star Wars and it's like James Bond. There's some stuff that every fan knows about. There's always a bit of trivia about like everybody knows about it. So I'm hoping there will be a few more like bits of nuggets of, uh, you know, behind the scenes stuff from all the films, all, all four or five of them, in fact, yeah. that will, um, you know, that they will show. Like we've done actually with Star Wars as well. You think you've seen all the deleted and behind the scenes footage and stuff. And then suddenly Lucasfilm kind of roll out another kind of couple of angles or something that you've uh, never seen before. So it'd be nice to see some kind of behind the scenes footage of 
Raiders and stuff like that. For me, and probably like you could say for you, that, that's kind of like the golden era of, of our cinema. Hopefully, Dial Destiny will then give people a bit more of a, a reason to hop onto Disney Plus and see it again. Anybody who has seen it once and then discounted it, I think they are doing themselves and a film a disservice. Still don't quite get why that film didn't connect at the cinemas. I guess there must be multiple reasons. I thought it was fantastic. And I think it will get a reappraisal on a streaming platform where people can watch it as and when and just get into it, enjoy it for the great adventure it is. But you make a great point about the documentary. You always hope that there's hidden clips and moments that you've not seen not that long ago. And it's been out there a while, but it kind of surfaced again. The moment in the making of Temple of Doom and Barbara Streisand comes out and she's direct making the entel and starts whipping Harrison Ford when he's on the on the yeah. rock in Temple of Doom and just silly stuff like that. So you kind of hope that there's more moments because the archives, Lucas from archives are just insanely deep with content and stuff that has sat there in boxes. And we found this around the era of when J.W. Rinsler did his first making a Star Wars book and then started mm. delving into Star Wars and also, of course, did a making of indie. And was just going through the archive and finding interviews and footage and audio that had literally sat there for 20, 30 years and just not been touched. Hopefully, some of that gets pulled out. Hi, this is George Mann, and you're listening to Panther Tracks. So the 1st of December, we'll see the arrival not only of Dial of Destiny on Disney+, Plus, but also the special edition Skywalker pilot collection from Columbia. They've been doing Star Wars-themed jackets for quite a while now. This probably is the most vivid range of them all. Mark, you cosplay as an X-Wing pilot, or costume, I should say. So mm-hmm. when you saw this first time announced, what was your first impressions of it? You could see why snow speeder pilots wouldn't get lost in the tundras of Hoff, because they are bright and orange. Excuse a pun, but this is really cool. Although I'm sure, <laughs> judging by it, this should keep you nice and warm. It looks, again, like Columbia have really spent a lot of time and and a lot of attention to detail and done some things and have kind of taken, especially the the classic X-Wing pilot flight suit, and then they've riffed on that and merged it into the snow speeder jacket as well for this flight suit. I mean, for somebody who doesn't ski, would like to ski actually, but it looks kind of really cool. As I was saying on Good Morning Tatooine, and actually as Claire Henry was kind of saying, you know, the price point, Although it seems steep for those who aren't necessarily versed in like snow pursuits and stuff like that, it's actually pretty decent $500. You can pay a lot more for other stuff. Um, and like I said, I like how they've kind of integrated a lot of um, practicality into it. So you've you've still got the kind of ribbed piping down the, the sleeves like you get in the Snowspeeder pilot and also what you see in the Resistance pilots later on in the series but you know you've you've kind of put in pockets into that and they've done these nice little touches with a rebel uh, logo on the sleeves and underneath certain pockets there's a little bit of kind of like x-wing pilot schematics and they've really spent a lot of time and thought into like how can they you know, how can you elevate this to the next level so not only is it functional but also that it's something that yeah people could wear and and feel like actually they are out and, and off so i reckon it's a winner just to be boring and kind of bring it all the way back down to earth. I wouldn't consider any of this stuff clearable with the Rebel Legion as it stands, just because they've taken a very faithful design and they've extrapolated it and riffed on it. So if you're thinking about this as a, a route for a costume, at least with some of the costume clubs, I would avoid it. But at the same time, if you're heading for the slopes this winter, I think you should really consider this whole range because it does look pretty down awesome. There's a whole bunch of stuff in this range. Yeah. Let's, let's go through it and see what you think. So there's the Skullwalker Pilot Ski Suit, which you've just mentioned, $500. It's an online exclusive. There is the Skywalker Pilot Ski Jacket. So that's a mountain-ready ski jacket. It looks fantastic. I think Columbia are kind of known, I would say, mostly for their jackets. What do you make of this piece? Yeah, I mean, it's really good. I mean, they released the Empire Strikes Back crew jacket not so long yeah. ago, didn't they? And yeah. that was, I mean, that looked pretty faithful. You can get a decent lightweight jacket from Galaxy's Edge, at least a Snowspeed one. I'm not sure how the prices compare, but I would think probably the Galaxy's Edge one is cheaper, so probably better for cosplaying. But ironically, although I wear orange a lot when I'm obviously in my X-Wing pilot, Orange isn't necessarily a colour I would normally gravitate to as a clothing item. Whether or not I would pick one up, I don't know. And actually something that does kind of riff off in some respects, I can kind of see where they get this kind of idea from. So there's a pocket, an inside pocket for the jacket. And on the front of the kind of the pocket, you've got the T47 income kind of specs and stuff. 
in World War II, pilots used to have these kind of uh, patches that either sew into or onto the back of their jackets. So if they were shot down, it would basically say in a number of languages, like French and German and stuff, I'm a, you know, an RAF pilot, help me to get back to my base. It kind of has that kind of vibe about it, which is pretty cool. We then got a couple of, I say more ladies jackets, aren't they really? The, um, the white ones, which is kind of like the pilot pullover, even though they called it the Skywalker pullover. Yeah, but, Skywalker Pilot Polo, one hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. Built for everyday adventures, as they say. So it's heavyweight cotton. You've got you've got two versions. You've got like the the X-wing pilot orange, and then you've kind of got a what they call like a you know a snow speeder one, which is kind of a white one, which slightly off white, really. Both basically the same design with the same logo stuff. It's a kind of thing actually. I wish I had had when we were stood outside Leicester Square for all those uh, Star Wars sequel trilogy <laughs> premieres. <because laughs> December, London, very cold, yeah. and that does look nice and toasty. Very good point. There's also the ski goggles as well. Three hundred dollars, so not cheap. Absolutely. I mean, that's the thing. I think people who don't ski it forget or can maybe take for granted that actually you know when you're up on the slopes and stuff the snow and the reflected light from the sun is blinding and you need a decent pair of goggles and they look very heavy duty thick elasticated strap what we've done there is they've taken the classic design of a like snow goggles luke wears but they've kind of wrapped it in a design taken from his red five x-wing pilot helmet so they've merged the two together and obviously because it's got a amber kind of lens again that's kind of like riffing on the the x-wing pilot helmet visor yeah. so they've really done some really nice clever designs and really thought not only about the star wars fan aspect and the design of it but also obviously practical application which i think is brilliant that's why it kind of sets columbia apart from some of the other brands because it feels like actually it's it's intended to be used and not just brought to be put on a shelf somewhere there's a long sleeve shirt for 70 dollars, a short sleeve shirt for 55 dollars, and a crossbody bag which is basically a bum bag for 50 bucks which is really cool those are cool details on that lots of pockets as well which i always yeah. find very very useful especially when we're doing conventioning and a pilot ball cap so basically a baseball cap for 40 bucks and that looks really nice as well so great range i think it's mm. so vivid and striking myself matt paul McHugh, and brian are off to fence next year to do some empire strikes back location mooching so something like this will be very very useful for us in the snow Hi, this is John Morton from The Empire Strikes Back. I'm Dak Rotha, and you're listening to Fantha Tracks. The Columbia Snowspeeder suit may not be clearable by the Rebel Legion, but here's something that might be in the future. I spoke to Mark Van Olen at New York Comic Con. We talked about all the stuff they've got coming out, including their X-Wing flight suit as well. So here's myself and Matt and Brian talking at New York Comic Con on the Danuo Novo booth. So we're here at New York Comic Con, we're at the Genuo Novo booth, and I'm here with Mark. Mark. Hi. Hi, Mark. How are you? Yeah. I'm great. Hello, English Mark. It Hello. is American Mark. Hello, American Mark. Um, great to see everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're at booth 3235, yes. New York Comic Con. Uh, it's going well. It's almost over already, Hello. which is kind of crazy. It all happens in a blur. What new stuff? And I'm looking at this dude right yes. here. We picked the right place to stand in front of. So this is one of our newest pre-orders up on the Genuo Nova website. This is our X-Wing Rebel Pilot jumpsuit. He's made of 100% cotton. And right now we're offering just the jumpsuit. So we're going to be adding the accessories at a later time. But we do have numerous X-Wing helmets that you can pair him with. So we've got Luke Skywalker, Blue Leader, Red Leader, Gold Leader, the Ray Salvage, and our customizable X-Wing. So you can be whatever character you like. Is this, and will this be, well, here's a question, have you yet done a snowspeeder helmet? No, not yet. And will that be compatible so, with it when you do? So, a <laughs> snowspeeder helmet, I'm not sure is going to be on the agenda. What? I am getting a lot of scout trooper questions, though, yes. and we do have a bunch of other helmets in the works. But I, my feeling is, like, everything should work together. Yes. So if we ever get to that type of product, like, it would, we'd want it to match up with the right costume, right? Um, and along with the X-Wing helmet, we also have our TIE Fighter helmet, yes. um, our TIE Fighter jumpsuit yeah. to pair with the helmets. And we have the gray version that you can do for a whole bunch of different Imperial costumes. So, yeah, the technicians, anything in the Navy, you get a hat, you get a belt, you're good to go. It's yeah. the easiest way into the costuming groups. We put a post on Phantom Tracks recently where you guys had laid out the outfit for Thrawn, mm -hmm. which is very similar to Krennic, yep. which was a perfect example of you saying that you can mix and match these. Yeah, very modular. So, um, and we did get some feedback too. A lot of people are saying uh, Krennic doesn't wear, or Krennic wears black pants, 
Uh, Thrawn does not. Yeah. He wears white, which is accurate, right? Yeah. So yeah. we want to get you as close as possible as we can. Currently, we have the Admiral tunic in that off-white color. We have three different badges that you can pair with that. The yeah. Grand Admiral, the regular Admiral, which works with Krennic, yeah. um, as well as Grand Moff, which will work with the olive gray Imperial officers. Yeah. Um, and then we've got the cape for Krennic, and then, of course, black cape pants, black Krennic tunic. Boy. Yeah. The cape is very dramatic. Have you seen it at other shows? We didn't bring it this time, but it, it, it's like, it's super big. So, um, very dramatic piece. What are the new helmets can you show me? Yeah, there's a beautiful array of stuff here, as there always is. We have a range of stuff. So, do you want me to walk you over there and show you? Absolutely. All right, excellent. This is one of our newest helmets on the website. This is our first order snow trooper helmet. He's made of fiberglass. He is gigantic. He's one of the biggest that we have in the lineup, and it's because of this hood on the back right here. Yeah, he's a big boy, for sure. And the inside, like all of our fiberglass helmets, are fully lined and comes with multiple cushion pads and they're all washable. So you can uh, adjust them as you need to based on the size and shape of your head. So this is one of the last items on the Anova's back order. Like, things are coming along really well on that front. I was going to ask about that. Where yeah. are you on that process? Because obviously it has been the process. Yeah. Oh, it's been a long one, right? We're in, like, year two-ish. Uh, we went live in August of 2021. And as you know, I started at Rubies in January of 21. So I had a little less than six months, a little more than six months to get rolling and get live on all things to new Onova. As of now, we're about 85% fulfilled on the back order, all the items that are in stock. That's the percentage that they make up of the back order. The ones that are on pre-order now include the First Order Storm, first order Snow Trooper, yeah. the classic Snow Trooper, which is uh, right up there, uh, which is the ABS plastic version, the originator of this guy, right? Uh, we have the Death Trooper helmet, which is coming along, and then we also um, have the, what am I, oh, the Patrol Trooper from Solo Star Wars Story. Next year, we'll be putting up the Sabine Wren Season 4, Death Trooper Specialist, and then the Kylo Ren Ensemble, and then, oh my god, it's over, we're done. So, and we can move on to new items, which will be thrilling. Yeah. You say new items, obviously, once you get to that, that barrier, I guess, it, it, was, it was going to feel great for you guys moving yeah. forward. Without giving anything away because you can't, how far out are you looking? What, uh, how broad are you casting your net? Oh boy. Um, so we have numerous streams of content now, and of course a whole back catalog of movies to talk about. So even the jumpsuits, they weren't on the back order, but they were in the Anovos catalog. We were able to get all the info, and we felt that that was like a staple item to have in yeah. the mix. So I do want to go back to original trilogy. I do want to look at some additional prequel items, but the new streams of content like Ahsoka and Andor coming back for season two, yeah. those are some dig sites we're looking into. There might be another Imperial officer uniform of swords. We did see a lot of ISBers in yes. Andor. Yes, yes. Um, there was another iconic uniform in Andor that we might be working on sometime soon. There's only one way to know what that might be and you should follow us at our social channels at Denuo Novo. Um, and then on the Ahsoka front, there were some striking helmets that uh, yes. appeared, including the Sabine in her colors, like the silver and pink. So we're looking into all of those things. Nothing's 100% yet, but those are the dig sites we're looking into. Can we get the right assets? Can I get like 3D files and like good photography and really make it look like it's screen accurate? You know, that's really the plan. And because you're moving forward on your own steam, if that's the right way of putting it, uh, and technology moves forward and access to assets changes, of course, the work you've done before is, is super accurate, but you're always striving for more perfection, more perfection. Exactly. Has the technology progressed to the degree that you are getting even closer, closer, closer to that? Yes, and the nice thing is with Lucasfilm being able to provide such like on the new movies, high-res assets in a way that you could have never dreamed of in 1977, yeah. right? One of the things people always ask us about, especially on the Imperial officer uniforms, how many sewing rims are on the top of the hat? And the answer is yes. There's like six or seven or five or whatever because there wasn't accuracy or I shouldn't say there wasn't accuracy. Uniformity. There wasn't uniformity around uh, costuming in 1977 because no one imagined a, a world in which 40 years later we'd be doing consumer product, right? Yeah. Whereas now there's intentionality to this, right? Like this is built in a way that we know it can be replicated for not just the number of people that were on film, yes. but that some crazy costumer is going to want to put this into a market, right? Um, including the um, the individual makers, right, with 3D printers. And of the new stuff that's come out, uh, that's available now, and as you said, there's always stuff coming out. Not that you can ever really pick because they're all your baby, but which one, as you, your Star Wars haul, which one oh would you gravitate towards? Oh, you know what I'm having a lot of fun with at the moment? Uh, we have that customizable X-Wing. 
And so our X-Wing helmets are available, as I mentioned earlier, with like Luke and Red Leader and all those. But we know people want to really be their own thing, do their own thing. The customizable is just a blank white helmet. Um, and I see it being delivered to me off camera right here. Excellent work. This is our blank X-Wings, the customizable. And it's got the solid white acrylic. It's the same mold as all of our other X-Wings. Uh, the visor right here, the, the microphone, the chin strap. And we have uh, some pads on the inside. We actually give you two donuts so you can move, uh, remove them as needed. And then you'll get a set of water decals with all of the like major symbols. So like the Rebel Alliance and all the little swirls and swishes and all that kind of stuff. So you can do up your own helmet. This I'm having a lot of fun with. So um, I want to do more customizable stuff in the future yeah. to really let you be the character. Yeah. So that, that's the intention to give, obviously, screen accuracy. Yeah. Let people be the characters that have seen on film, but also yeah. have enough scope that they can add that flair of individuality to their costume. Yeah, I sort of imagine like two buckets up to Nuo Novo. Like, Novo's really leaned in on rematch the thing you see on screen, uh, end of sentence, yeah. right? I think that there's a building component to this as well, and we've seen it with like the First Order Stormtrooper kid and all the other builders. Yeah. They add their own scuffing, they add their own marks, they add their own colors. Like, and now I think of like if Anovos was servicing 501st Rebel Legion, I want to do that and Mando Mercs and all the other guys who are saying I want to have a Mando helmet in purple and orange and kind of like Mando season three with the yes. explosion so of Mandos. Yeah, yeah. Like, I can't do all those helmets, but I can do a blank with some, some different like earpieces on the sides yeah. or like you change the keys out on the back and then you can paint it as you need. You know, get some auto paint and you're good to go. That's a fantastic yeah. idea. That'll be fun. That'll be different, right? It will be yeah. different. It's Saturday as we speak. Mm -hmm. There's another bit and a day of the show to go. How much have you enjoyed the show so far? Oh, this one's been really fun. I mean, look around in our booth right now. There's so much fun stuff happening. Kids are playing with lightsabers. People are trying on helmets like there's no tomorrow. Um, we're not getting the customer service questions that we got at like Celebration 22, yeah. where I sat at that desk for like four straight days just answering questions about when you might get your order. Yeah. Now it's like, oh, hey, I received my order. And this, this is a great story. We were in San Diego um, just a few months ago, right? We had a bunch of 501sters come to the booth in their Stormtrooper uniforms, their armor that they built from our kit right. that we delivered that was from the Anova's back order. So we delivered their kit, they built it, and they got it 501st approved, and then they came to our booth and took pictures with us. So that is the story that I couldn't have written two years ago. I was only imagining a time that product was even in hands, and then I had like the happy ending to that story. It's very special to get anything approved by the five because they yes. are so exacting. Yeah, so that's a big ticket. Oh box. yes, it's been wonderful. We had a few five hundred firsters come by today, including a guy who was in our Imperial officer. Which I would say that's the easiest way in. I'm I'm actually not in the five hundred first full disclosure, um, but I do understand that like buying our tunic, our pants, the belt, the hat, and then you add the little data sticks, and you get some stuff, some good boots from somewhere else, not us, because we don't do boots. Um, you can find your way in relative easily yeah. just I always tell people contact your local garrison because you need to be styled correctly tailored correctly like the sleeve hits here not here like it's very that right yes, yeah very much so where can people find you if they want to know oh boy about so Dino follow us at Denuo Novo hello hi that's my good friend Carolyn video. you're all good so sorry. it's good she's one of my good friends from our days at Star Wars actually um, so and this is what I love that's actually the other thing I love about being at these shows we yes. run into our friends yes. right so we're all one part of like giant galaxy yeah. Um, but yeah find me at Denuo Novo and then of course I'm also at Darth Von Olin and you can keep up with all the latest of all of our shenanigans over here tell us about the podcast yes okay so I'm also a YouTuber like, like everyone else um, in Star Wars <laughs> I have a show every Monday night on the uh, Virtual Cantina Network, um, so you can find them. It's the Facebook group that's called Star Wars Celebration Japan 2025, or YouTube at the Virtual Cantina Network. And I'll be on Monday to talk about Star Wars Rebels, like we always do. Yeah. It's actually Zero Hour Part 2. We're doing some Thrawn episodes. That's a great Thrawn episode. And we'll do a little New York Comic Con recap. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for being fun. So good seeing you. Thank you for flying all the way across the country oh, just no, to see just me. Just to see you. I know, this is amazing. Oh, so no. worth the trip. <laughs> for everything in one location daily news, reviews, interviews, podcasts, video, and social media feeds, bookmark fanthatracks.com for Star Wars News 24 7, 365. With a musical career ranging from 1954 right up to the present day, the career of John Williams has been incredible. And whilst this box set doesn't include his Star Wars work, it does include an awful lot of work that he's done with the legendary Steven Spielberg. It's at 24th of November. It's a 20-disc box set called The Legend of John Williams. And there's music from all across his career. The box set looks beautiful. There isn't a price yet. I can't imagine you getting much change out of 
about 150 quid for this because it's mm-hmm. 20 discs and it seems to have everything. There's Indy in there, there's E.T., there's Jurassic Park, there's all sorts of amazing stuff. We spoke about Williams before, Mark. You know, it, his music is the soundtrack to many of our lives. When a set like this comes out, which gives you the chance to appraise not necessarily his Star Wars work because that feels like a thing all of its own, but the other work that he's done beyond that, it's kind of special, isn't it? Especially now the guy's in his 90s. Obviously, far more music behind him than in front, but hopefully there's plenty more to come in the future. Just looks like a very special box set, doesn't it? Reading through uh, what you're getting in, in it, I, it's very much, I think, an audio files box set as well. Or, or definitely a you know an audio file and a cinema lover box set. 22 hours of music, so that's 373 tracks. 20 CDs, which, which span 60 years. There's stuff from things that have been remastered and come off tape and everything else. So it's a shame that the Star Wars music isn't in there. I think maybe in some respects that would probably put the price up to that point whereby it would really limit even more the, um, the market for it. Whilst I don't think many people necessarily say Star Wars has overshadowed the rest of his work, it's nice that it's set apart so that actually some of the other works can be listened to and it's going to be just fun just to be able to track through his own musical evolution as well because i think that's what's really cool and i like that with you know with some bands like you listen to their first album then you listen to the most recent album and you're like how the hell did you get there because Mm. they sound totally different but then when you listen to all the albums in between you you start to notice where the light motifs are coming in where there's different instrumentations or instruments that he started to experiment with that then become mainstay in other later scores so from a number of different aspects i think it will be well worth getting and treasuring in the future it's like in a book isn't it really it looks at least the the image is look like it's more kind of in a book and the cds get pulled out so that's quite unique because like let's be fair a 20 cd um dual case that's not very appealing but something like this now but most people i think have sold all their cds it can fit onto a bookshelf rather than have to sit into a cd rack it is beautifully presented you listen to his musical career and obviously music changes taste change his style changed you listen to close encounters et jaws era 1941 there's a sound there's a specific sound you move up to his turn of the century music with not so much phantom menace that that kind of feels like it's very much his own thing but certainly attack of the clones the early potter stuff ai minority report they feel of a time in terms of how he composed so it, it's very interesting to see those subtle changes and you don't know it at the time you don't realize it at the time because it all no doubt it's john williams it doesn't sound like anybody else there's a lot of influences especially in the original new hope soundtrack that came from external places because that's kind of what george wanted but then you get to empire and especially Jedi, they're very much their own thing. I think this will not only interest lovers of John Williams' music and the films that are present in there. If you're an indie fan, this makes it a reason to buy it just there. E.T., one of the highest grossing movies ever, Jurassic Park. It says 1960 to 2022. We've already had a John Williams score in 2023. Dial of Destiny, I think, was only released on vinyl. I don't think it's available on CD yet, so... There's more to come. If you collect this, it's not the bookend. It's just more to come. So I think it just looks phenomenal. I'm certainly going to be looking looking for a way to get this into my collection. This is Charles Soul. You're listening to Fanta Tracks. Dave Filoni worked on Star Wars for numerous years, worked under the tutelage of George Lucas, and after Lucas moved on, very much became the focal point of Star Wars creativity. He has been surging on with The Mandalorian, The Book of Boba Fett, Ahsoka most recently, and up ahead with Skeleton Crew. But speaking to the StarWars.com Instagram page, he did mention how working in the Star Wars world and folding in his own stuff is important, but also essential to moving Star Wars forward and making it fit with what George Lucas would have done in the past. So it's a lovely clip. It's worth listening to. It's only a few moments long, really. It's maybe 30 seconds long where he discusses the legacy of creating these stories. But on a broader point, you've got Lucas who set the stall out and gave everybody the remit to go and do what they did and oversaw certainly the first six movies and The Clone Wars. But we've moved way beyond that now. It's 11 years, as we said on Panther this week, 11 years since the Disney purchase. We still talk about Disney as if it's a new thing. It's over a decade. It's not new. But now, and Lucas is a long way out of it, we understand that Feloni still talks to George about certain things and runs things past him. 
I think, as a mark of respect, as much as wanting that input and opinion. But how do you feel about that? It would be very easy for Filoni in his position to really completely take over Star Wars, if you like. And he's certainly got the creativity and the clout, if you want to call it that, to do that. As it mentions in the piece, bringing in the space whales, bringing in the world beyond worlds. There's lots of things that he has brought into Ahsoka that are very much, I'm waggling the air quotes, felony things. Do you mm. think there's a balance to be struck before it starts to not feel like Star Wars because George is the kind of cornerstone of everything that Star Wars should be? It's trying to really answer a question which I think is probably the hardest thing anybody can really do and and kind of say what is star wars and what isn't star wars it's like how do you distill it down obviously the further away we get from the films there's still ideas and conversations that dave's having but then if dave moves on or what have you or has a row with kathleen and she boots him who you know who's left to maybe have have a link back to george it's a tough one but the thing is also And it's me who's going to bring it up. Look at Star Trek. I think that's probably the only example, really. Gene Roddenberry died. And look where we are now. And yet there's so much of Star Trek that's been produced since then that still very much feels like Star Trek. And it hasn't felt too samey. And it doesn't feel like they're just reusing old ideas and stuff. They've pushed things on and they've dared to experiment and go in different directions. And it's not always worked. I think that is the key. If you can close your eyes when you're in the cinema or watching Disney Plus and and it feels like Star Wars, then it's Star Wars. Whoever's directed, whoever's written it, it doesn't necessarily matter. You think about all those 400,000 expanded universe books and basically the characters are George Lucas's. But the actual stories and all the other additional new characters bear from the, the authors. And it's down to each author to try and take Star Wars in a in a slightly new but also familiar direction. And it's also the, I think, the duty of creatives to experiment. If you play it safe on some levels, I think that's kind of when you fail. But I think mm. also there's playing it safe and there's experimenting. And then obviously you then fall into the lines of like, are you subverting things for the sake of subverting storylines and characters just because it's something new and radical and it kind of gives you a, an opportunity to do something different? Obviously, those are all very big episode fill in conversations that the fandoms had really since I think The Force Awakens has been announced, really since George sold Lucasfilm to Disney. And and had to step away from the project. So it's a real tough one. And so I've not really given you an answer, I'm afraid. I don't think there's necessarily an answer. I think sometimes with Star Wars, no. it's it's the tone of it and the vibe of it. It's such a difficult thing to discern and distill and say, here's your story and there's your actors and everything's fine and just drop a dose of this in and it'll feel like Star Wars. I think some people in the past have said they kind of know what the magic touch is to make it feel like Star Wars. I don't necessarily think that's true because I think it's different for different types of stories. Let's say you write a novel. You can only give the novelist Del Rey and Lucasfilm will sit down with the writer. They sketch it all out. They kind of work up the parameters that the writer obviously has things they want to bring in and some will fly and some won't. But then you've got to give them that concoction and say, well, go and cook us a mega Star Wars cake. And it's got to be down to that creative to make that thing work. And for some people, it'll work and others, it won't. But in terms of television, I think, Filoni has got as close as as anybody could hope to get. And you could argue, and a lot of people did until relatively recently, that even George Lucas couldn't figure out what made Star Wars work because those prequels were bashed and bashed and bashed. People coming into the fandom now who are more invested, more interested, joined in the last 10 years, will look quizzically and go, people didn't like the prequels? When they came out, it was like, you mentioned Trek, it's like when Next Generation came out, and it's like, you can't do Star Trek with, without Kirk, Spock and McCoy. Who's yeah. this data guy? But I think with finding the, the nugget of what makes Star Wars Star Wars, Filoni's done as good a job as anybody in making it feel like event television. You're sitting down to watch an action adventure. Star Wars has always got to be a little bit cheesy and a little bit corny. If it's too cool, it doesn't work. If it's too silly, it doesn't work. They stepped close to the line in Phantom Menace a little bit with some of the Jar Jar stuff, but it worked. A Lucasfilm production generally is not something that only gets watched once. So it's a tricky one to figure out. Also a tightrope for Filoni to walk as well. Do you know, I, I always come back to Back to the Future when um, Marty McFly is on the stage and he's just playing Johnny B. Good. Mm-hmm. And he's kind of like, uh, your kids are going to love it, but this is a little bit too early for you or a little bit too much for you guys. I'm paraphrasing completely. However, my point is, is that sometimes that's what happens. And I think as a filmmaker, you need to be that slightly forward thinking about actually 
not only how is my film going to be received now, but how is it going to be received in 10, 15 years time? You know, because that's what creates a legacy. And I think that is kind of what builds a franchise as well, more than anything. The human nature, it seems very much that we don't like change. And there was a big tonal shift and change between original trilogy and the prequel trilogy. And then there's been, again, a, a tonal change and a shift between the prequel trilogy and the sequel trilogy. The sequel trilogy doesn't necessarily sit well with them, but I think sometimes that's what it is. And I, I think also it's preconceived ideas and notions of what Star Wars is. And that's why we now get this kind of hashtag, not my Star Wars. Most people can't actually put their finger on it. It's like if you ask 20 people, what is Star Wars about? You're going to get 20 different variations and differences as to what they think it's about. Good versus evil. It's about family. It's about hope. Blah, 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 blah. Because of that, that's what allows Star Wars to thrive 40 plus years on. If you were to remake Star Wars, if you if you were to either remake the original trilogy shot for shot or take those characters, and it's like it's the lightning in the bottle scenario that only happens once in a blue moon. You put out Barbie two years ago or you put out Barbie in six months time or two years time. It might only make us money back, you know, because that's how the, the, it's the nature of like how audiences change and how fickle they are sometimes. So sometimes it's just a how kind of like perfect storm of like, you know, the right casting, the right story at the right time, release at the right moment for the audience of that time. And I think that is where it's really difficult. And the thing is, you've got to juggle all that or probably as a creative, you don't. You probably go, do you know what? I can't worry about that. I just need to tell the story that I think people will enjoy and I'd like to tell. You know, everybody can go, oh, we don't need a Han Solo story or we don't need an Andor series. But it's like, well, of course we don't. We don't need any of it. I mean, it's entertainment. It's frivolous. It's meant to be there to entertain us. But actually what we need is food and a roof above our head and somewhere nice to lay. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's really all we need. And all the rest of it is nice to have. It's great that we've got all these series. And, that. and if one series or one show or one episode of a series or even one film doesn't necessarily sit with you, I think it's down to for people to actually be able to explain why it's not working and actually give concrete, solid reasons, not just because, well, you know, which is, of course, what most people do. I'm going to get my soapbox now. <laughs> no, you're right. You are right. It, it's difficult to whittle down what it is. You kind of got to give the floor to Filoni because he has done so well with what he's done so far, certainly with the Clone Wars, but also with all this other stuff. Yeah. Like with Star Wars, you know, there's so much extrapolation in Star Wars. When you look back at the original trilogy, things we kind of assume that we know. Now, whoever's writing Star Wars now, be it for television movies or books or comics, has kind of got to find the gaps in the stories to fill them out. You mentioned Rogue One. Rogue One is basically telling you everything you already knew in the scroll up of the original film. The Clone Wars is basically telling you everything you ever needed to know when you read the opening couple of three pages of the 1976 novel. Obi-Wan Kenobi leaves the character where you picked him up in the start of the show. So you've got to find these little gaps to tell these stories. But ultimately, people wanted to see Rogue One. Once they'd seen it, they realised, wow, how lucky were we to get a film that good? People wanted 7, 8, and 9, whether they liked what they got. That's not the point. People wanted 7, 8, and 9 that had wanted it since the last frame of the very first time they saw Return of the Jedi. You had no idea that in 1983 you'd have to wait, what, 30 years to get what came next, which was near as damn it, The Force Awakens. You just didn't know. So it's wants versus needs, as you say, versus all the other aspects. You've got to give it to Filoni for trying to build something that not only takes in within it what Luke has set up and maybe a lot of threads that he would have told if he'd had the time or the inclination to do it. It kind of feels like Filoni's picking up a lot of that stuff to move it forward. But, you know, he's not a George clone. He's doing his own thing. So it's a tricky balance, but I think he's doing as good a job as anybody could hope to. He's doing a great job. And I think also... That's what we don't want. We don't want a George Lucas clone because, mm -hmm. you know, for everybody who loves George Lucas, there's somebody who thinks actually he's the worst thing about Star Wars. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah. all that, like, there hasn't been a good film, a good Star Wars film released since like 1977. Therefore, you need different voices, you need different approaches. And whether or not you agree necessarily with how the business is run, I think the fact that um, Lucasfilm and Kathleen Kennedy has been one of the people to kind of open up and start to bring in 
different voices and talent and stuff. I think it's commendable. And I think it's also something that the, the whole film and TV industry has needed for many, many years. And obviously, I'm going to sit here and probably the next show that comes out, it won't be my Star Wars because I've got my own preconceived notions of what Star Wars is and isn't. And everybody should, because that's what kind of, I think, makes the fandom quite interesting. It unfortunately makes it toxic at times, but, you know, on the flip side, it gives us something to talk about. You're wondering why we don't have a listeners' question, and that is because nobody has written in. So therefore, if you'd like to send us a question, or thought or theory or comment, about anything to do with Star Wars or anything that you've seen on the FanTrax website, you can do so. But in order to know where to send it, you're going to have to listen to Mark for the next 220 odd seconds. So Mark, can you tell the people where they send their writings? Yes, I can, Mark. And this is how you do it. So thanks for listening to Making Tracks. If you want to be a part of the action, visit PhantherTracks.com and be sure to comment, like and share on our social media feeds at PhantherTracks. Send in a list of questions like Mark says by emailing radio at fantatracks.com. Subscribe, leave a review, preferably a five-star one, on Amazon Music, Audible, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your podcatcher or smart speaker of choice. And as always, thanks to James Semple for composing the Fantatrax intro, Adam O'Brien for our Making Tracks opening music, and Mark Daniel and Vanessa Marshall for our voiceovers. Tune in to Good Morning Tatooine. It's live Sunday evenings at 9 o'clock UK, 4 p.m. Eastern, and 1 p.m. Pacific on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. And check out our Fantatrax Radio Friday night rotation every Friday night at 7 o'clock UK time for new episodes of The Phantom from Down Under, Planet Layer, Desert Planet Discs, Start Your Engines, Collecting Tracks, Cannon Fodder, and special episodes of Making Tracks, and every Tuesday at 7 o'clock UK time for your weekly episode of Making Tracks. And remember, Fantatracks.com, our social media feeds, Fantatracks TV, and Fantatracks Radio are absolutely free. So no Patreon, buy me a coffee, Kickstarter or Indiegogo required to stay updated on all the latest Star Wars news. And for episode 176 of Making Tracks, that's me done for this episode. Well done, mate. That was definitely not 220 odd seconds. You rattled through that nice and quickly. So look, dude, I will um, catch up with you very soon once I'm back from España. Make sure you listen to everything else on Fan Tracks because it's amazing, especially last week's episode of Good Morning Tatooine with yours truly on it. Stay safe. And of course, as always, may the force be with you. Coming up next on Fanta Tracks Radio, it's another episode of Making Tracks.